Good morning. Let's stand together. Let's stand. All right. Welcome to the house of the Lord on this Memorial Day weekend as we take time and remember those who gave their lives for our freedom. Amen. And how many of you love America? Amen. So I want us to start out this morning with this great patriotic hymn. Let's sing together. My country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountain side. said a good amen. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you today. Happy Memorial Day weekend. Um, as pastor said, we remember those who sacrificed something or everything so that we could have our freedom today. We remember that. But I want to remember someone who forgave me someone who healed my heart, someone who gave me salvation, someone who is mine and I am his. And he put everything underneath my feet. He gave me a new name, which is written down in his book of life. And that name is Jesus. Everyone shout that name Jesus this morning. Jesus, shout it again, Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your son today, for the sacrifice that you gave, for the life that was given in our place, where our sins were placed upon his back and he bore that on the cross. God, we thank you for that. But it didn't just end at the cross. It didn't end at his death. He rose again. And because of that, we have life forevermore we can experience joy and victory in the midst of defeat. God, we can experience life and peace and love. And Jesus, we thank you for this service today that we can come in here and express our thanks to you, to express our giving to you, God. We thank you for everyone in this church today. Amen. Amen. How lovely your dwelling place, O oh Lord Almighty, my soul longs and even thanks for you. For 
and make that declaration to him. Hallelujah. Almighty God, we love you, Lord. We praise you, Jesus. We praise you, Jesus. What a fellowship. What a fellowship. What a joy divine. and secure from all alarms leaning 
with the Lord. Praise the Lord. Lord, and as Proverbs says, it teaches us to not lean upon our own understanding, but to just lean upon you, Lord, just to come to you. Sometimes, God, we just kind of find that a little difficult to do because as human beings, we think that sometimes we can fix it on our own. But, oh, Lord, we always, whenever we do that, we always mess it up. So teach us, God, to not lean to our own understanding, but to look to you and to wait, Lord, for your timing. For we know that, God, if we wait upon you, you will reveal the answer, you will show us the solution, and we will see that all things work together for our good. Teach me, Lord, to wait down on my knees till in your own good time you my please teach me not to
If that is your heart's cry today, would you just say a good amen? Amen. Go ahead. You may be seated.
Thank you, Ken. That one true almighty God is here with us right now. And he will make a way where there seems to be no way. Say, God will make a way where there seems to be no way. Works in ways he cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide. Hold me closely to his side. With love and strength for each new day, he will make a way. He will make a way. Again, God will make a way. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide. Hold me closely to his side. With love and strength. For each new day, he will make a way. He will make a way. By a roadway in the wilderness, he'll lead me. And rivers in the desert will I see. word will still remain. He will do something new today. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. Hold me closely to his side With love and strength for each new day He will make a way He will make a way Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Ah, oh, Lord, sometimes it just seems it's an impossible road that we walk on. We come across obstacles, stumbling blocks, potholes. We come across tragedy. But you are Jehovah Jireh. You are the God who shall provide. You are the God who provides every one of our needs today. You bring provision for our healing. You provide provision for our material needs. You provide provision for anything that we need at the moment. We just worship you, Jehovah Jireh. We thank you for making a way where there seems to be no way. Amen? I... Um, I'm going to just share a little bit with you today, just from my heart. Um, Nancy called me this morning, right before I came in here. Uh, she had a, a rough night, uh, and she asked me, she said, how are you doing? And I said, not well. 
So last week was um, a, a hard week. I responded to three different incidences involving children. A one-month-old where it appears, or it appeared at the time, was laying on the bed with the mom, and in her sleep she rolled over on its head, and the baby died. That was on Tuesday. On Thursday, I just got home, took a shower, sat down, was just getting ready for dinner, and I got uh, called out to a seven-year-old who was uh, hit by a vehicle and killed. And then Friday night, just after I had gotten to bed, and just falling asleep. The phone started blowing up. We have an app that all the PD uses and we communicate that way. And uh, they were looking for people to respond to a situation. Uh, it said a six month old child, but they were hopeful uh, the baby had a pulse and uh, I didn't know all the circumstances. But I was just so exhausted from the day because I had worked hard that day outside uh, and um, as well as did a couple things in the house. And I did that all on four hours sleep. And so by the end of Friday, I was just exhausted. And when I saw that one of our other chaplains had responded, I said, I'm just going to let him handle it. And I just texted everybody. I said, I'm sorry, I am un I'm unable to assist on this one. But then yesterday, because of my wearisomeness, I was unable to get up when I would have wanted to get up to get things done and get an early start of the day. So I was running really late, and by the time I got here, it was late morning. And I just came in and went through a couple things and was set down, was changing my shoes out so I could go pick up the trash. There was quite a bit of trash out there. And uh, the phone rang, and it was our dispatch. Wanted to know if I was the chaplain that went out the night before, and I said, no, one of our other chaplains did. But she said, well, would you be available to go to the hospital because it doesn't look like the baby's going to make it. So I went to the hospital yesterday and sat with, with the mother and uh, the mom wasn't home at the time when this incident happened. She was working, and she works in Glendale. She was working in Glendale, and the baby was with a babysitter, and uh, the, the babysitter checked on the baby. It was asleep on its back the way it should be, but the baby has, the detective told me that the baby has a habit of rolling over, and so in between checking on it the baby rolled over and when the, the last time that the sitter checked on it the baby's face was and so now that baby is on life support uh, I, I, I don't know how many of you saw the email that I sent out yesterday uh, stating that uh, I'm going to cancel service tonight not for my own benefit but as I was leaving the hospital yesterday, the mother asked me if I could return today. And at first I thought, well, it'll probably be uh, Sunday night before I could get there. And uh, talking to Nancy and thinking about it, there's no telling how long I'll be there. I don't know when the family's going to make a decision regarding the uh, life support. I know that yesterday I anointed that little baby with oil while they were running tests. Uh, she asked me, she said, uh, do you anoint with oil? And I said, sure, but unfortunately I don't have any oil. And her mother was there, the baby's grandmother, she said, I can run down to the kitchen and probably get some. I said, any kind of oil will do. And I said, if they can't give you any oil, get one of those little slabs of butter. 
we'll use that. But she came up with a container of oil. And we anointed that little baby. I, I pray for God to do a miracle. And I spoke to that little baby. And I said, you are in the hands of God, Drexton. And I'm believing, I'm speaking life into you. I've prayed that way over a lot of children over the years. I took a little boy many years ago who had drowned. And when the hospital finally had the parents to leave, before I left, I took and I laid my hands on that little boy. I called him by name. I said, open your eyes and arise. I wish I could stand here and tell you that that happened, but it didn't. That does not change the fact that I still believe. And fortunately, the mother and has had a solid upraising in Christianity, and uh, so I'm thankful for that. So we're not going to have service tonight because once church is over with today, I'm going to go back to the hospital and I may be there for a few hours. I don't know. However long the family needs me, I will be there. So I, I trust that and hope that you understand our situation there. So this morning, when I would normally get up, go to the gym, have some time, prayer and reading maybe, I didn't get out of bed until about 7 o'clock. And my body is just has not been cooperating much last week and starting this week. And on the way to church, I was going over scripture memorizations and verses that I could quote. I've quoted for years, and it's like I was stumbling with it, would have to go back. So I'm hoping that when I preach, my mind will connect properly today. And you won't leave here thinking that, uh, man, pastor is uh, losing it. I, I'm not losing it, honestly. No matter what my wife says. <laughs> um, but I just began to think yesterday after returning back to the church how Satan's robbing us of our kids. Whether it be through deaths of these little ones, innocent little babies and children, or he's robbing us of our kids by deceiving them into believing that they can be anything they want to be no matter how they were born. And he's using all kinds of organizations and even government to promote that. Satan is doing his best to rob us of our kids. He's already robbed us of millions and millions of babies through abortion. And today, this being the, the Sunday that we celebrate Memorial Day, those especially on the battlefield who have given up their lives for our freedom. But then I also think, and I don't mean to take away from that at all, but I also think about infants and babies and children that have lost their lives due to the, due to the, due to the carelessness of people abusing rights. And I just think it would be good today, before I move on, for us to just take a moment and pray for the children. This little boy that I'm going to, this little baby, six-month-old baby that I'll be with this afternoon, his name is Drexton. So I would just ask you to just mention Drexton in your prayer. His mom's name is Paris. And, but I want us to pray for the children that God would just protect them. We 
Because if Jesus tarries, there are hope for a continued nation that fights for freedom. At least we know this, that these little ones are in the arms of Jesus Christ today. Would you just bow your heads with me and just, I'm not going to say an outward pray, prayer right, right away. I just want you just to pray from your heart. Just pray from your heart. Father, I know that you will make a way where there seems to be no way. Because as I call on that precious holy name of Jehovah Jireh, our provider, you are here today to provide for your people. You are in that hospital room, and not just that particular room, but Lord, there's a floor full of kids and parents and children in that hospital wing. Be there with them. Be with the parents who are at home that are grieving, who lost their one-month-old baby or their seven-year-old this week. And I pray for Drexton. If you haven't done so already, raise that baby up. Open its eyes. Let it begin to move. I speak life into it now in the name of Jesus. And Father, for each and every one that is here today, and they're dealing with physical issues, I just want to just say, touch them right now touch them right now. Lord, I pray God for those who are struggling with things that have brought sorrow to their life. Touch them right now. Make a way. For those in this congregation, Lord, for those that are watching online that are facing issues in their lives and they just don't know what's going to happen next or they don't know which way to turn, God, make a way where there seems to be no way. Because God, you are the great provider. You are the way maker. And I ask you, Lord God, to just touch. Where there seems to be no way He works in ways we cannot see He will make a way for me He will be my guide Hold me closely to His side He's holding you, church With love and strength for each new day he will make a way. He will make a way. Sing with me. By a roadway, by a roadway. In the wilderness, he'll lead me. And rivers in the desert will I see. Heaven and earth will fade. But his word will... 
will still remain. He will do something new today. How many of you believe that today? He's going to do something new today. Amen. Praise him, church. Oh, God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide. Hold me closely to his side with love and strength. this let me hear you with love and strength for each new day he will make a way he will make a way ah praise him for that one amen <laughs> hallelujah hallelujah Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. God is good all the time. God always has a purpose. Doesn't always go how we want it, but his purpose is higher. His ways are higher than our ways. And so, so thankful that you are here today on this holiday weekend. I know that a lot of people are traveling. And we've got some that are not here because they're gone for the weekend. But I'm glad you're here. How many of you know what holiday really means? It's not a day off or a barbecue, but it's a holy day. Holy day. And so we, uh, we honor the Lord as we remember what the day stands for. Hey, just want to welcome... I, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm looking around. Uh, I don't know if we have any here for the first time or not. But if you are here for the first time, uh, we're glad that you're here. We'd like to just ask if you are here for the first time, if you uh, wouldn't mind standing. We just want to welcome you with an applause just so we can see where you're at. Anyone here for the first time? All right. No one. No one. All the first timers are vacationing this weekend. So anyway. Uh, but be sure and check the, uh, at the desk. If you did not do so coming in, make sure that they've got you marked down that you're here. Uh, and uh, we're trying, to, trying our best to follow up with absentees. Not able to always do that. Not even sure if I'm going to be able to do it this week or not. Uh, but um, we're trying because we want people to know. So I ask you, if you know of someone who's not here, and you've got their contact information, reach out to them. Make sure they're doing okay. Let them know we miss them. Pray with them if they need prayer. Offer to serve them if they need assistance with anything. All right? So uh, let me just share with you. Don't forget again, no service tonight. We will resume next week. But uh, our leadership meeting is Saturday uh, at 10 a.m. back here in the back. So all the leaders and the board members and the teachers be ready for that. Next Sunday is our Joash Chest Sunday as it is the first Sunday of June. Can you believe that already? Uh, and uh, it's here. And, but we're going to uh, celebrate with Joash giving. We'll give you an update on that. So just come prepared for that as well. And then men, the sign-up sheet is out there for the uh, breakfast. So be sure and sign up for June's Men's Breakfast. And then also the sign-up sheet out there for the Fall Festival we brought that up last week. Thank you for those who did sign up, but we still need a lot more. That's the, the festival is going to be Friday, October 18th, but we need a lot of people. We need setup crews, people to work games. We need people to help us tear down and clean up. Uh, and it's a, it is a hard day, but boy, it's a rewarding day when you see the crowds come in and we get to interact with, with people and uh, just show them the love of Jesus. And we pray in that process that they will experience something that they've never experienced in a church crowd before. And they'll say the following Sunday, Hey, family, let's go check out these people on Sunday, see what they're like. 
and we can get them in here. That is our prayer and our desire. So be sure and sign up. Check your calendar. Make sure you're free. And then if you are, mark that calendar, say Fall Festival, so you don't book anything on it. And be a part of this great event and help us. There'll be more information coming uh, as time progresses, but we need people to sign up now so that we know if we're going to have enough. If we don't get enough workers, we cannot do this. And it's been such a great success. We didn't do it last year because we felt like we were going to be short of workers. But we're taking another step at it this year, so please help us out, okay? There's something for everybody to do. So there's other announcements in the bulletin, so be sure and check those out. Also, I want to thank you for your giving this month. You can see we've still got quite a ways to go uh, on the month. And this is, this is the last Sunday, and it's the last service. Uh, so we uh, appreciate you supporting New Life and obeying God with the tithe, 10% of whatever God's blessed you with. That's God. You give it to Him. And then over and above that, if you want to give a little love offering above the tithe, uh, that's awesome. And it's your support that keeps us going. I'm asking you today to do two things. Give, fa give Father his tithe. And then number two, if you can do more, do the very best that you can and obey God. Uh, please help us close the month out in the black. We're a little in the red again. So your help is so very, very important. For those watching online, you can help us this week. You can send a check. Uh, by mail, P.O. Box 1325, Mesa, Arizona, 85211. You can go on our website, mesanewlifeaog.org, and give online by clicking on the Give tab. Uh, you can also use your mobile phone and look up the Tithely, T-I-T-H-E dot L-Y app on your phone and find New Life Assembly of God Church in Mesa, Arizona. There's a lot of New Life churches out there. So be sure that you uh, look for the New Life Assembly of God in Mesa. And for the rest of you, you know where the, the offering boxes are. So thank you so much for your support. All right? Okay, we're going to have you stand and uh, give you five minutes to get out and greet one another uh, and uh, shake some hands. And then we're going to bring you back to your seat with something for you to watch, all right? So go ahead, let's put the clock up, and you're off. Go for it.
there's a story about a guy named Joshua. From the Bible? Yeah. Yeah, that's the one. God told him to build a memorial out of stones. Yeah, the stones were to be a reminder of this great thing that God had done. So we know it's not the same thing, but we were wondering if we could remember your dad with you. Remember all the great things he's done. Sure. So this one here, this one's for remembering a great friend. This is uh, for his part, keeping my kids safe at night. You got one? Not yet. Um, this one's for him being the reason I even know anything at all about the Bible. <laughs> yeah, me too, actually. This is for dragging us to church that first time. This is for freedom to worship. His sacrifice for that. This one's for not letting his best friend stay mad at each other. You know, he loved the simple things. Things like people getting to speak their mind or having dreams and pursuing them. This is for defending those things. You know, you don't have to do this if you don't want to. I want to. It's okay, buddy. Just take your time then. This one's not just for my dad but for all the people like him who help protect their country. I'll skip to that one. If tomorrow all the things were gone I'd worked for all my life And I had to start all over With just my children and my wife I'd thank my God above To be living here today Where the flag still stands for freedom And they can't take that away And I'm proud to be an American Where at least I know I'm free And I won't forget the men who died And gave that right to me I proudly stand up next to you And defend her still today Cause there ain't no doubt I love this land God bless the USA From the lakes of Minnesota to the hills of Tennessee, across the plains of Texas, from sea to shining sea, from Detroit down to Houston and New York to L.A., well, there's pride in every American heart, and it's time we stand and say, that I'm proud to be an American Where at least I know I'm free And I won't forget the men who died And gave that right to me I'll gladly stand up next to you And defend her still today Cause there ain't no doubt I love this land 
God bless the USA. And I'm proud to be an American, where at least I know I'm free. And I won't forget the men who died and gave their life for me. I'll proudly stand up next to you and defend her still today. Cause there ain't no doubt I love this land. God bless the Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. I couldn't help but think, though, when I sang that line, there's pride in every American heart. And we look in the news today and we realize today something that we have never seen like we see it today, that there are many, many people in this country who are not filled with pride for America, that there are many today who are shouting death to America along with their chance to death to Israel. But I want to tell you something, those people, they are not, even if they've been born here, they are not true Americans. True Americans know what it's like to love their country. And whether you've been in the military or not, all of us should count it a privilege to stand up and fight for her if we need to. Amen? Amen. Let's go to Genesis chapter 17. And while you're opening there, I actually did not finish everything that I was talking about. So when I went to bed last night, and uh, it was kind of stressful day yesterday. When I went to bed last night, it was somewhere probably close to 10 o'clock by the time I got in bed. About an hour or so later, my phone rang, and it was Becky. And they're two hours ahead, so I knew, okay, this is not good. So I picked up my phone. She said, Dad, pray for us. We're in the middle of a tornado. And... Uh, <clears throat> They were hunkered. They have a little closet underneath their stairs. When they bought their house, they were told that's where you want to go. And uh, they were hunkered down in there. And she was telling me of um, a podcast guy that a lot of people listen to. And so I looked him up, found it, was able to go into the uh, living room, and uh, I put it up on our television set so we could all see it and he was giving minute to minute second to second updates on what's going on tapping into various traffic cams that you could not see anything because the rain was so hard and uh, it was a storm that was filled with lightning um, and he would he would say right now it's over Centerton that's where Becky and Justin live uh, he's, and then he would say, it looks like right now it's, it's over Bentonville Square. Uh, and you could just hear. And so we sat there for probably over two hours watching that, watching the, all the various colors of the uh, radar uh, signals and listening to that update. It finally started passing on down into the southeast. Uh, but... Becky was, was calling us several times during that time to say, we're okay, we're okay. However, when the, uh, the, the horn went off, their tornado warning horn is just literally across the street from their house. So you, you can't miss it. Uh, and when it went off, they all jumped up. She said, Abby was so good. Abby ran into Elena's room and got Elena up and hugged her and wrapped her up and helped her down to get in there. Becky, in such a hurry, she missed the last step of their staircase and fell and probably sprang her foot. It was really hurting her really bad at the time, but she says, I don't think anything's broken. Um, so for quite a while, we're sitting there watching that. We're praying, God, turn it around. And then she called one time, and she says, 
it is we can hear it it's really loud um, and there was a lot of a hail uh, a lot of wind a lot of rain um, we're not sure if the tornado actually touched down in Centerton or if it was just high winds but she called me this morning and said uh, Justin had a chance to get out and the only damage to their house uh, was uh, they, their patio furniture disappeared and he's got to repair uh, one rain gutter so I'm thankful for that 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 was all that they experienced but she said not too far from them a lot of houses that lost their roofs and things there is a children's home um, that their church ministers to and helps support and some of the teenagers of that home actually go to the church they took a lot of extensive damage so instead of having a regular service their congregation was gathering together for a short service and then they were going to rally together go over there and start working at the children's home cleaning up the mess and doing whatever needed to be done Justin was going to be a part of that uh, but she said when he opened up the front door there was an angry snake right there and uh, I said well it could have could have gotten blown in there you know but uh, so that was kind of the start of today uh, you know how many of you know when when you just get to sleep and then all of a sudden your sleep is disrupted with something sudden uh, it's it's a little difficult to kind of relax after that and so as a result Nancy did not get to sleep till four o'clock and then when she woke up her blood sugars were pretty low like at 50 and so uh, that was kind of the start of our day so that kind of will maybe help explain to you um, why I'm in the shape I'm in today. Uh, so anyway, I'm going to give it my best shot today, and I want us to go to Genesis chapter 17, verse 23. By now you should be there. Amen? So Abraham took Ishmael his son, all who were born in his house, and all who were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house and circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very same day as God had said to him the title of my message is simply D-Day D-Day is that term for a secret date on which a military operation is to begin and the expression D-Day became current during World War II when it defined the dates set for allied la allies landing on enemy-held coasts. The most famous one that we are aware of, we're just getting ready here uh, in a couple weeks to remember it and celebrate its anniversary, the most famous one being June 6, 1944, when the Allies invaded Normandy. Now, in this passage of Scripture, there are actually two different sermons that I want to bring from these verses. Not today. Even though I may go a little longer than I normally would today, but since I'm not going to preach to you tonight, you can afford me that extra time so I can feel like I hit you good all right today I'm just going to use this one verse to launch off from and then next Sunday I'm going to include this verse and then the some of the other verses to finish but I believe that there is an important lesson contained in the next two weeks that if we don't get it and if we don't get it right then we might as well hang it all up now and quit, folks. And so today, I want to talk to you about D-Day. But there will be a difference between the military D-Day and the one that I speak of today. And as I mentioned earlier, this is a term for a secret date. But the day that I am speaking of is today. 
Paul announced it when he said in 2 Corinthians 6, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Say now. So normally we think of the term of salvation and we always refer to the saving of a lost soul from hell and, and that is to be included most definitely. But I also want to include other aspects of salvation. There are other things that we need salvation from, to be set free from, to be delivered from. And I wish to give you three areas today that we need to declare a D-Day on and attack the things that stand in our way of being what God desires us to be. Because you and I as Christians, we have one thing in common to every military man or woman that has served in the armed forces and those that, and we, I know that we're, we're losing them rapidly and we're at the very end of the lasting ones, but the World War II generation. But we still have the Korea generation and we're kind of getting, start to get to the end of them, but we still have the, veteran, uh, the Vietnam uh, generation. And, and of course, then we have the Middle East conflicts, and which is kind of our current generations. We have one thing in common with all of them. We all have an enemy. Now they fought an enemy that you could see with flesh and blood. But every single one of us have an enemy that we cannot see. And sometimes he uses flesh and blood. But these battles are won, not on earth, but in the heavenlies. And I'm sure that there are many more but these three I found, and I want to share them with you to the best of my ability. Starting with this one, number one, we need to declare a D-Day on the flesh. A D-Day on the flesh. Now in verse 23, Abraham is about to take part in something that God commanded him to do. Circumcision was introduced by God to Abraham as a sign of the covenant. We've talked about that. Every male was to be circumcised. Not merely the children and the bodily descents of Abraham, but also the, those who were born in his house and those who were purchased as slaves. Now, everyone that was not circumcised, God said, was to be cut off from his people because they've broken the covenant. Once you were circumcised, you bear within your body an identification that you are a Jew. Now, as Christians, it's a little different for us. We are circumcised in Christ. The physical circumcision was a putting off of a part of the flesh as a symbol of covenant relationship of God's people with a holy God. But the spiritual is putting off not a part of, uh, of the flesh necessarily, but an entire body of flesh. And even as Christians, the body of the flesh possesses qualities that are controlled by the old nature. There is nothing good within my flesh. The spirit and the flesh are always warring against one another. How many of you understand that? You know that by experience. I mean, the spirit is willing, indeed, but the flesh is weak. And I know that because the last few days, you know, my normal routine is to get up early, go down to the gym, because I got to keep my youthful look. <laughs> Not only that, but I got to keep my heart in shape and keep the blood flowing, flowing through the through the veins and, and try to stay healthy and in shape. And I've not been able to do that hardly. My, my spirit was willing, but my flesh did not want to get out of bed because it's weak. And the problem that we have is this. The Bible says this, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And as Christians, we want to please God, right? But that sinful nature keeps us 
from accomplishing what we want to do. And yielding to the flesh will bring nothing but destruction and death. When I yield to my desire to do something ungodly, I am really bringing death to myself. When I yield to my nature and my anger gets out of control, I am bringing death to myself. When I yield to my flesh and let laziness keep me from doing what I ought to do, then I am bringing death to myself. The things the flesh wants to do are the things that kill the spirit. So I have to make sure that my flesh does not control me and that the only way to make sure that doesn't happen is to declare war on it, to declare a D-Day. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul is writing to the church regarding wickedness that's in the church. You know, people wonder all the time why the Lord hasn't come yet for His church. They wonder when He's coming. Let me tell you why the church is still here. The Lord is coming for a church that is without spot or wrinkle. How many of you understand that? But I'm going to declare today that the church is still spotty and needs some ironing. Can I put it to you that way for you today? The church is spotty and it needs to be ironed. I'm talking about the Lord's church in general. When Paul wrote to the Romans, his theme was the righteousness of God. When he wrote to the Corinthians, he enlarged that theme and talked about the life of righteousness in the Christian. Today, Christians are getting a lot of teaching and preaching on how to live in this world socially and successfully. But how much are we being taught how to live spiritually? I heard two youth pastors one day, and this was some time ago, but I recall the conversation. Two youth, two youth pastors one day were saying how one was approached by a deacon board of their particular church that they served in. The other one was approached by parents of teenagers telling them that they were giving too much Bible to these kids and that they wanted them to start having games. And I kept, during that time, I kept getting these emails about a Christian event being held at the ASU auditorium and there was going to be a local evangelist and a couple of Christian bands. And I read some of the bios, and one of the bands was saying how one of their songs had been played on a couple shows on MTV. Now, back in the day, MTV was more known for its music videos. Now I notice that they show movies. But this was back in the day when they were highlighting music videos, and uh, uh, one of the songs of this Christian band was shown on MTV. One of them, the show was called My Super Sweet 16. The other show was called Pimp My Ride. Well, that really sounded Christian to me. So I went online to see what that was all about. My Super Sweet 16 was a show about spoiled rich kids who have these huge parties when they turn 16. And one of the things that this one teenager wanted for her, was her first car. She wanted a BMW. It was, uh, I can't remember the model, but it was a BMW something or other. It was a $120,000 car at that time. Well, that was just a little too much for the parents to spend. How many of you parents can relate to that one? Uh, so they got her a Mercedes Benz instead. It just cost uh, just a little under that. Now, I don't know about you, but that was not the kind of values that I wanted my children to grow up with. Sometimes I'm not sure if we're not like the men of Israel committing fornication with the women of Moab, which caused a terrible plague that killed many Israelites, if you remember that incident. And I can tell you this, that just about every time I go to a seminar or a meeting, that discusses methods of reaching out and ministering to people, a lot of times I always go away feeling like I don't belong on this planet. 
Of course, that's not too bad when you think about it, because I wasn't created by God to live on this planet forever. My home is in another world. You know what I ask God? I ask God, I ask Him to build a church to show the world that the power of God can still change people. That the preaching of the Word is what transforms lives and the Holy Spirit is the one who brings them in. That living holy and being faithful still works and that one day if I ever get called up to tell other pastors how to build a successful church, the only thing I have to say is don't be afraid to go against the tide, follow God and trust Him. That's the secret, ladies and gentlemen. Preach the Word and the church will grow. I mean, we feel like we have to compete with the world, and so we adapt to the times. But I still believe that the God of today is not any different than the God of yesterday. He never changes. And if the early church grew up by just preaching the Word, then I believe that today's church can grow if we remain faithful to preaching the Word. Well, I know it's easy for somebody. Somebody approached me a week or two ago, maybe it was last Sunday on the way out, and they said, it just doesn't seem that the church is growing too much. And I looked at him, and I said, well, we're getting there. Because God makes a way where there seems to be no way, man. A lot of people have come in here, and they said, man, I just don't understand why this church doesn't, doesn't grow isn't running more people oh, I can tell you why it's because in the last days the Bible says that there are many who give in to they have itchy ears and they don't want this kind of preaching I'm content staying with this kind of preaching and I don't mind preaching it to our young people and I pray that they hear it and listen intently and learn from it and, and I, I'm believing God that God still changes lives through the preaching of the Word. I mean, we as Christians must act in our lives what we believe in our hearts. It's a serious thing to profess to live the life of a Christian. If we go around lowering the standards that Christ has set, then we give the wrong testimony to our neighbors. Paul said that you are an open letter that is read of all men. What's your neighbors reading when they read the mail? I ask you a very pointed question today. What kind of gospel is the gospel according to you? If you're living your life so near the edge of questionable things that someday you may fall off, it's time to plan a D-Day and attack your fleshly desires. Circumcise yourself, cut off the flesh, and live totally with the Spirit. If you fall, others are going to fall with you. Righteousness, ladies and gentlemen, only comes from God, not ourselves. I mean, we can say we're going to change, we can say we're going to do better, but we can't change a thing until we look to God for the help and the strength. Righteousness comes from God. It must be shown in our daily walk. What would Jesus do? That should be the question to every questionable thing in your life. In the Corinthian church, there was a member there that actually married his own stepmother which was socially immoral among the pagans to say nothing of the Christians. And the church, instead of, of coming against that, they were puffed up with pride while this scandal existed in the church. Church, what sins are lurking about us today that are going unnoticed? I mean, today, and I know that what I'm preaching may not, it, it's nothing new. I've preached along these lines before but this is the beauty part of going expository in the scripture you just take whatever the next verse is and this is what the Holy Spirit gave me for this verse but today I know that we have assembly of God deacons that drink beer and sip wine and in ev evangelical churches there are pastors that are homosexual while preaching the Word of God and, and in other churches pastors are having affairs and youth pastors are molesting girls in the youth group and then I've, I've heard of pastors and youth pastors that have gone and committed suicide. And the only reason why those things are going on today is because we really don't believe that Jesus is coming any too, anytime soon, if at all. In fact, do we really even believe that there is a God 
who is holy and righteous. Because if you believe that, then it will dictate what you do. You know, remember when Joseph was, was tempted by Potiphar's wife, he said, how can I sin against God? Paul recognized the works and the sins of the flesh, and he knew that the flesh had to face destruction before the soul could be saved. And this is what he said. And I'm going to tell you, this is not politically correct in any church today. But this is, this is what Paul said. Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. I mean, we've got to get the spots and the wrinkles out. Amen? The sins of the flesh must be cast out today, church. This is D-Day against the works of the flesh. When God showed Ezekiel the vision of the restoration of the temple, God said, Thus says the Lord God, No foreigner, uncircumcised in heart or uncircumcised in flesh, shall enter my sanctuary, including any foreigner who is among the children of Israel. And then Paul comes along, later on in, the, in Galatians 6, and he writes, Do not be deceived, or excuse me, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. So listen to me right here, church. If you're not walking in the Spirit, if you're giving in to carnal nature, giving in to fleshly desires, you are being cut off from the Spirit of God. God will not move in a person's heart and life when they are controlled by the flesh. People's lives are not getting better today. They're decaying more and more each day. I mean, I think today is a pretty good argument against the theory of evolution. Where man doesn't improve, he's getting worse. They've sowed to the flesh, and they're reaping corruption. Declare D-Day today, folks, to the flesh, and begin to walk in the Spirit. Praise in the Spirit. Live in the Spirit. For he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Paul said, I say then walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the Spirit. You'll be able to say no. Let me hear you say no. You can do it. Walk in the Spirit and you won't be trusting in your own strength, but rather you'll be looking up to where your help and your strength comes from. Walk in the Spirit and you will surrender to His will, not your own will. Walk in the Spirit and the spiritual adultery will cease. Walk in the Spirit and the unclean will be made clean. For those who have feelings against your Christian brother or sister, crucify, attack your flesh today, begin to walk in the Spirit, and everybody, even me, will look beautiful to you. I mean, we're, we're living in such an age of lukewarmness. People don't care anything about anything other than themselves. There's no burden for the lost. There's no desire to change from sinful ways. There's no desire to crucify the flesh. We, we need that desire, folks. We need to want to change. Even if you think that you're the holiest person in the church, you should still have a desire to say, God, search my heart. Make sure. I mean, we must want God's Spirit. And when we get to that place where we want God to touch us and change us, then He is able and He will take us that are dead in our sins and the uncircumcision of our flesh and quicken us together with Him, having forgiven us all of our sin. If you're dead today, He can make you alive. If you're fleshly now, He can make you spiritual. If you don't have it all together today, Jesus can make you whole. Declare D-Day right now on the flesh and let God arise in your life and let His enemies be scattered. Amen? Amen. Amen. Number two, D-Day on sin. D-Day on sin. Normally I'm kind of starting to wrap up, but are you going to hang on with me today? 
Yeah, I mean, if any of you decide you can't stay, I'm going to keep preaching anyway. All right, number two, D-Day on sin. Exodus 12 gives us the, it's the thrilling story of the Passover, the clearest Old Testament picture of our individual salvation through faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Perhaps the children of Israel did not know the significance of this feast the night before they left Egypt, but they believed God and they obeyed. On a certain day of the month, the lamb will be killed and the blood applied. And I want to declare today that it is a D-Day on bondage. It's D-Day on captivity. It's D-Day on Egypt. God announced deliverance from bondage, but at the same time, God was showing Israel how he was going to rescue all of mankind by the blood. The feast of the Passover was to be celebrated and remembered every year, and it was, it was to point the people in the direction of the cross where God announced to Satan a D-Day on sin. God said, I'm going to invade and I'm going to attack sin. I'm going to take away the sting of death and the victory of the grave. The world doesn't have to be bound by Satan's clutches anymore. And God had a weapon ready for D-Day and it was the blood of his son Jesus Christ. And the blood fell from the cross that day on Calvary's hill and for every drop of that precious blood that hit the ground it rattled the gates of hell and through his sacrifice not the sacrifice of goats and calves for Hebrew says but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all having obtained eternal redemption the blood of Jesus ladies and gentlemen can wash away sin today no matter what is in your life Today's the day, ladies and gentlemen, for, for holiness. Say holiness. Today's the day for consecration. Say consecration. It's D-Day on sin. It's time to attack. It's time to run the devil out of our midst. It's time that we let him know he is not welcome here. It's time that we declare that Jesus Christ saves. It's time to stand up for God in the streets. It's time to stand up for Jesus in the schools. It's time to stand up for Jesus in the workplace. It's time to stand up for Jesus in the midst of a country that is letting everybody else stand up for what they believe in. We cannot be silent. We cannot be ashamed of what we believe in. We cannot be afraid to be different. We can't be afraid to say, I don't do that because I'm a child of God. I'm a Christian. Not by society's definition. No, I, I, I'm an old-time, Bible-believing, born-again, washed-in-the-blood, tongue-talking, Holy Spirit-filled, shouting Christian. It's time to attack sin in our lives. It's time to attack sin in our homes. It's time to attack sin in our church. Sin is getting a stronghold on people today and the church needs to pray. The church needs to plead the blood of Jesus Christ. No one needs to be bound by sin. If you believe that, say an amen. So I think of how Paul was cast onto the island, had just experienced the storm and the shipwreck. Satan tried to stop the children of God any way that he could. I mean, he couldn't kill him in the storm, so he tried another method. And Paul went over and he began to collect some wood for the fire. And the Bible says that as he reached down, out of the sticks he was collecting, this viper came out and attached itself on Paul's hand. And Paul, I mean, when, when the natives of that island saw that, they just knew he must be an evil man and he was going to die. Paul just looks at it and flings it off. Because folks, you don't have to be bound by anything today. You don't have to be bound and tormented by sin. I'm, I'm speaking, I may not necessarily be speaking to an individual in this room because there are no first time attenders and we're all family here, but I'm probably speaking to somebody hopefully watching online. And if they're not watching today, they may be later. But you don't have to be bound and tormented by sin. All you have to do is apply the blood of Jesus and that chain will fall from you. A song was written many years ago that says, Anybody here want to go to heaven? Say, I do. <laughs> and I'm saying today, if you want to go to heaven and live forever, 
Cast off sin. Declare D-Day on the sin that has you bound. Let the blood of Jesus Christ wash you clean. Now, I may not be talking to a sinner today. I don't know, but sinners are not the only ones that need forgiveness of sins. Sometimes we Christians do, and we act in a way that's wrong. Let the blood flow because Jesus, as God told Israel, take the lamb without blemish. Christ is coming after a church, folks, without blemish. And a blemish can be big or it can be small. A blemish is simply a physical defect, a stain, a spot, a scar. It's something that mars completeness or perfection. It can be hidden and no one notice it, but it's still there. I mean, some of you women here today, you, you use makeup to hide a scar or a blemish. You might be able to cover it up, but you can't take it away. The Christian might be able to hide the blemish or the scar, but you can't remove it. Only Jesus can remove it. Today is D-Day on imperfection in our, in our Christian walk. Today is D-Day on impurities and falsehoods in our lives. Today is the day for revival to sweep across our church and let the Shekinah glory fill this place and fill our hearts with joy and gladness. That's what it's going to take for us to join the throng in heaven and sing a new song unto the Lamb. And it's a song that says, and the, the lyrics are given to us in Revelation 19, Hallelujah for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give Him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and His wife has made herself ready. I, don't, I haven't heard the tune yet, but there's the lyrics. I wonder how many are guilty today of putting Jesus back on the cross. Hear me now. You see, Pilate had the power and the authority to save the life of Jesus. But because he evaded his responsibility, Christ went to the cross. Oh, I, I know that this was a plan of God, but think about what I'm saying. Pilate washed his hands before the multitude and said, I am innocent of the blood of this man. Not my problem. Doesn't affect me. But you see, Pilate was a sinner too. It was his sins that hung Jesus on that cross. And whenever we know that there's sin in our lives, we fail to recognize it. We try to hide it. We don't declare a D-Day on it. We take a step toward forgiveness and restoration. Then we, we might as well pick up that hammer and that spike and begin to drive it in the hands and feet of Jesus again. The blood is flowing for you, but you must come to it. It will go everywhere you go once it's applied, but you must come to it additionally. Come to this fountain so rich and free. Cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. How many will say glory to his name? Amen. Number three. I'm going as fast as I can. You believe that? But I've got to stay within the speed limit. Amen. Number three. Today is D-Day on hindrances of total submission. Exodus 34, God said, Observe what I command you this day. Behold, I am driving out from before you the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the, and the Hivite and the Jebusite. All Israel had to do was observe that which God commanded them and he would drive out the enemies. The Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, they were all hindrances to God's people. Israel could not possess all of the land until these hindrances were removed. And there are many of God's own people today that are missing out on the full promises and the full inheritance because they're hindered by one thing or another. I want to declare a D-Day on things that hinder us today. It's time we let God drive these things out and start living in the fullness of God's glory. One of the biggest hang-ups that we as Christians have is our rights. I've got a right. And Paul had to address that issue too in 1 Corinthians 9. A man was, was walking down the street swinging his arms around from his chest and by mistake he struck a 
passerby right there in the face. And the man that got hit was furious, and he started to strike the man back. Say, hey, hey, isn't this a free country? Can a fellow do his exercises on the street if he wishes? And the guy looks at him and he says, yes, he sure can. But remember, where my nose begins, your liberty ends. We may feel that we have the right to do what we want to do. But if your liberty harms another, then your liberty has gone too far. And there are even times when it's hard to s submit to those who have authority over us. We say, well, they're not going to tell me what to do or how to do it. But if we can't submit to the pastor or to the board or the teachers or the parents, how can we submit to the Christ whom we haven't seen? Paul talked about receiving the things that he had a right to receive. He had a right to receive what was due him. But he laid that right down. And he said, but I've used none of these things, nor have I written these things that it should be done so to me, for it would be better for me to die than that anyone should make my boasting void. In another portion of Scripture, he talks about having the right to do certain things. But if it's a stumbling block to your Christian brother, then you have no right. But what I see people not receiving the full blessings of God because they don't want to submit themselves to Christ and to his service. People everywhere are making the mistake of thinking that they know better than Jesus. One preacher put it this way, when you were a child and you used to play cowboys and Indians or cops and robbers and you got caught, what did you do? You raised your hands in the air, right? You'd been caught and you had to surrender. Do you know what you're doing when you raise your hands to the Lord when you worship? You're surrendering your rights. Amen? You're surrendering your rights. And when you refuse to do that, you leave no room for the Lord because unless He has your whole life, He won't take it. Christ will not settle for just a portion because our nature would be to give Him the least portion and keep the rest for ourselves. And I've seen people that wouldn't come to an altar and get saved because they didn't want to give up their rights. They didn't want to be subject to a higher power. I've seen people that didn't want to participate in something because they didn't want to take orders from somebody else. They'd rather do things their way. Ladies and gentlemen, there comes a time in our life that we need to surrender. And the greatest example of someone surrendering their rights is when you see Jesus hanging on the cross. He didn't have to do it. He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and to set him free. But instead, he did something he didn't have to do. He did something he didn't want to do. And he died alone that we might be free to live. And if you're bound by self-centered thoughts, and always looking after your rights, then you need to declare a D-Day today. Paul asked this question in Galatians 5 and 7. You ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Whoever or whatever has become a hindrance to you, whatever it is, declare a D-Day on it. Now let me close by going back to Abraham for a moment. Verse 23 said, on that very day, Abraham. He didn't wait. He didn't put it off to a convenient time. He did it that very day. As soon as God told him to do it. Last Sunday, I delivered a message to you that came from my heart. I shared with you about getting a new vision about yourself and God bringing forth fruit from a barren womb. Ladies and gentlemen, God has given us promises, but promises don't come until there is first obedience to the Word. Some of you, I, I really believe that some of you want to be a part of something big that God does. And there's probably some that don't care or even doubt. 
I mean, I've had people tell me. I remember years ago, a pastor told me, this was before the fire, we were in the old sanctuary, and we, I, we were talking about, uh, one day, we're going we're gonna to build a, a, a better church building. And this pastor literally told others, that's never going to happen there. I mean, there are people who will doubt and they'll one day be pushed aside by the hand of God and forgotten about. I can tell you that particular pastor, he's not a pastor anymore. He backslid last I heard. Nobody knows anything about his ministry that once existed. I believe the most of you, though, you really want to be a recipient of the blessings of God and the promises of the covenant. But you have to start today what God says. So this is what I'm asking you today as we close. First of all, those here, if there's anybody that needs Christ, you have sin in your heart, that's got to that's gotta be taken care of. You've, the only way for you to get to heaven is to declare a D-Day on your sin and come to Jesus Christ today. I can help you with that today, but you have to be the one to come. And then the other thing is, I want this entire church, everyone who wants to be a recipient of God's covenant blessings, I want you to just come and humble yourself before Him and seek His face. And as the church comes, then those who need to ask Jesus for forgiveness, those who need to confess your sin and repent, you come to me, and I'll be right down there, and I'll pray with you. But I just want all of us to come. And I know a lot of times here lately when I've requested that, the majority still sits out there. Well, that's between you and God. But I do believe that God will turn his focus on those who put forth the effort and say, God, I'm coming to humble myself today. And you can stand, you can kneel at the altar. If it's too, too hard to stand physically, then sit in the front row. And if the front row's filled, take the second row or whatever. But I think it's just a sign of us coming together and it's letting God know how serious we are about this. You say, God, I want to declare a D-Day on sin. I want to de declare a D-Day on my flesh. I want to declare a D-Day on those things that's hindering me from being all that I can be. Maybe some of you are dealing with, with um, things that people have said about you. I've had people say some pretty ugly things about me. I, I've, had, I've had a couple pastors in secret, but it got back to me, say, well, he's, he's not qualified to pastor a big church. Okay. I don't know what insight you got, but I think that's up to God. It's not up to him. Maybe, maybe you're dealing with some hurts and things that people said about you. Maybe they said you're lazy, you're no good. They said, you know, sometimes those words affect us for years to go. Declare a D-Day on it. And let God know how serious you are. And let the devil know how serious you are. So if you come and you need prayer for sin, if you know, if you're confessing sin in your life, and you know that things are not right between you and God, I'm right here to pray with you. And these altars are open. But would the rest of you also come as a sign of unity? And just say, I'm coming today to humble myself before God and I'm going, to let, I'm going to surrender. I'm going to give the sign of surrender today. And I'm going to say, Jesus, here I am. Here I am. You see, we celebrate Memorial Day. American forces, we don't surrender. But as Christians, we do. Lord, I surrender to you. I surrender to you. 
Go on, just get in as close as you can. Make room for those that are behind you. Just make room for everybody to get in here. Kind of fill in through here. You can stand off in the sides. You can even stand in front of the altar if you need to. But I just want you to make room for everybody. And for those that are here, I want you just to give the sign of surrenderance and raise your hands and say, God, I humble myself. I declare D-Day and think. Let the Holy Spirit reveal things to you. Holy Spirit, what are the things I need to declare D-Day on today? Thank you. name of the Lord I just pray for Margaret today God you know all about this situation and God we declare a D-Day on some things that's hindering her right now Lord some feelings that is controlling her right now feelings toward people that are close to her God we declare D-Day in the name of Jesus as she confesses those things to you, Lord. You are here. You hear her. Lord, let the blood of Jesus just wash. Wash it away. Wash it away. Restore her. Create in her a clean heart and renew a right spirit within her. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Just have a conversation with Jesus about it, Margaret. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah, mighty God. For those that are watching online, would you just humble yourself before the Lord? Just say, Jesus, there are things I'm declaring D-Day on today. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. The enemy will not defeat us. We have authority in the name of Jesus. We have been given authority over sin. We've been given authority over our flesh. We've been given authority over the things that the enemy tries to do. We walk in the spirit, not in the flesh. Our weapons of this warfare are not carnal, but they are spiritual. We fight in the heavenlies with our prayers. And we call upon our Lord Jesus, who delivers us from all things. It's D-Day. It's D-Day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, you see this congregation today. You see all these people that are here in the front, Lord. They have gathered together. They have heeded my call. They have come today, Lord, to just symbolize unity and the thought, Lord, we, we want to be righteous. We want to be holy. We're not going to be bound by Satan. We're going to let our light shine. We're going to be a testimony of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. We're going to walk righteously. We're going to walk holy. We are going to be serious about serving you. 
Lord, we give our lives, we give our heart to you today. We say take full control. Lord, let there be so much of Jesus in us that when we get up next to somebody who doesn't have Jesus in them, may they get really uncomfortable. And may we have the opportunity to show them Jesus, to speak Jesus to them, and they get so uncomfortable that they say, what must I do to be saved? Let there be a shaking, just like in that jail cell when Paul and Silas were set free. And the jailer looked at them and said, What must I do to be saved? Let there be so much power and glory of God working in our behalf that people out here on the streets and in our neighborhood would look at us and say, What must I do to be saved? Oh, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Lord, I love you. I praise you, Jesus. I praise you, Jesus. I praise you, Jesus. I praise you, Lord. Just, just outwardly, just begin to just praise him. Just declare his holy name. I love you, Jesus. I magnify you, Jesus. You are holy, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. I praise your name, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the work that you do in my life. Thank you for the way you meet my needs. Thank you for your provision in my life, Lord. Thank you for all that you've given me, Lord, in this life. But most importantly, thank you for the home that is built for me in heaven. Thank you, Lord, for the promise that one day you're going to deliver us from this sinful world. And we will be with you forever in glory. Thank you, Lord, for that hope that I have. Thank you, Jesus, that this world is not my home. It's not my home. And we know this world's going to crumble and fall apart. But one day there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. And that holy city of Jerusalem will descend down. And, Lord, we get to be a part of that. We get to be a part of that. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. How many of you are happy in Jesus? Yeah. Praise the Lord. Well, listen, have a blessed Memorial Day weekend. Enjoy the rest of the day today. Get some rest. Think about me while you're resting, will you? And uh, uh, just uh, enjoy the day tomorrow. If you've got plans, be safe. If you're going to barbecue, eat hearty, all right? And uh, so God bless you. Hey, may the Lord bless all of you. May he just make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. And the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And walk out of here with forgiveness toward me for keeping you longer than normal today, all right? But uh, amen. God bless. Brother Bill. Precious Heavenly Father, what a privilege it always is to be in your presence just like we have been this day. Lord, we thank you for the D-Day, the ultimate D-Day that you gave your life for us. Let us never forgive, forget that you've done that for us by serving you as Christian soldiers, honoring you through our service. Bless us and keep us safe always until we can gather again to once again hear from you. Amen. <laughs>